Romans chapter 12, our scripture there, and as you can see how the title is related, Transforming, Not Conforming. <coughs> Excuse me. There, the apostle appeals to us and says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And this verse is mostly used when we talk about taking care of our bodies, and it is applicable to that. But I want to also apply it to, a, to our minds, which our minds, belong, our, our minds are part of our bodies. And, and so verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. It is the will of God that we be transformed. Do we see that in the, in the text? It is the will of God, his desire that we be transformed that we be transformed. Let us pray. Father in heaven, O oh God, help me and help us to be receptive to your Holy Spirit. This morning in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Is it safe to say that God has called everyone to be in the church? Or has God called specific people only and omitted others? No, God has called everyone, right? For God so loved the world that whosoever, whosoever is anyone, anyone, to be, to be called into God's church. And if you haven't noticed, the church is full of all kinds of people. Amen? All kinds of people from all walks of life, from all cultures, um, customs, ideas, from, from everywhere. And with that in, in mind, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 10, as we're going to see the people that Jesus called to be part of his church. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10. Is there is the calling of the 12 apostles, verse one. The Bible says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them what? Power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Amen. But notice who he called. Verse two. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Who else? Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. And not just Matthew, Matthew the what? The tax collector, that's important. Matthew the tax collector, James, the son of Altheus, and who else? whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, what do we know uh, about these people, about these disciples? Well, Peter, we know that Peter had a hard time controlling his mouth. He always had something to say. Always had something to say, whether it was right. Sometimes it was right on the money, and sometimes it was the worst thing to say. But he always had something to say. Are there people like that in God's church today? <laughs> always have to say something, right? D James and John were known as sons of what? Sons of thunder. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you remember there in Luke chapter 9, verse 54, where Jesus is not welcome at a certain city, and because he is not welcome, and Jesus was wanting to visit them, and they did not welcome him, there in Luke 9, 54, both James and John, what did they recommend to Jesus do? To burn up that city. They said, Lord, should we call fire down from heaven and burn them up? 
I don't think that's quite the response that Jesus is looking for. I don't think that is quite the attitude that Jesus is looking for. So here they were, they had a short fuse. They, they had a temper problem. Matthew, what about Matthew? It says here, Matthew, the tax collectors. What do we know about tax collectors for sure? They were thieves. They were thieves. Even John the Baptist, when he is preaching to the tax collectors, he says, don't take more money than what belongs to you. And Judas, we know that betrayed Jesus also along with Peter besides speaking all the time and speaking the wrong things he also denied Jesus but it's interesting that these are the people in verse 1 that Jesus gives power to and I would like to suggest this morning that we are not in the church for the reasons that we think we're in the church we're not in the church for the reasons that we think we are in the church. Because when I read this list of disciples, of apostles, they're not called because of their skills, of their talents, of their gifts to the church. They had major problems in their character. But they were called because God needed to change them. And so... If, if we're there in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at the call of Jesus in every single gospel. The call of Jesus is to follow him. The call that Jesus makes to his church and to his church members and to come into his church is to come and follow me. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. It says, and he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Mark 1, 19 as well. Mark chapter 1, verse 19. Jesus appeals, even beginning with verse 18, and immediately they left their nets and followed him when he had gone a little farther from there. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants and went after who? After him, after Jesus. They followed him. Turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 10. It says, and so also were James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to him, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. And John 1, verse 43. John 1, verse 43. It says, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and what did he say to him? Follow me. Follow me. The church, as I've mentioned, is full of all kinds of people. All kinds of people, but there is no one personality worth following but Jesus Christ. There is no other person that we should follow or imitate, whether it's mother or father or grandfather or minister or president or elder or fill in the blank. As spiritual as they may be, we are called in the church to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. There is nobody else worth following but Jesus. Every person that was called to the church was called to follow Jesus. Amen? Amen. And it, it's sad that too many people in the church get discouraged. Get, get discouraged. And how can we let another person be the reason why we stay away from church, why we stay away from prayer meeting, 
while we stay away from Sabbath school. We are not here to follow others, but to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus, friends. Let's consider who Jesus has, call, has, has called to follow him. Abraham. What do we know about Abraham? God called him, follow me. Well, one thing for sure that the scripture mentioned is that Abraham could lie at a drop of a hat. I mean, it was easy for him to lie and encourage even his spouse to also lie. Encourage others to lie. And his son, how do they say, like father, just like son, or like son, like father, had the same disease. And Jacob, Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, besides a liar, he had serious character problems. Serious character. But God had called them because he needed to change them. He needed to change them. God chose the sons of Jacob because they were hard to save and he needed to change them. He called the Jews and Israel because they were hard to save. God chose these disciples because they were a challenge to save. Can you imagine the characteristics of each of the 12 disciples that Jesus is trying to change and to mold into his character? With, with, with Peter opening his mouth, with thieves among the 12, with people who can't control their temper and wanting to just burn up people because they're not welcoming Jesus. And God and Jesus is just trying to change the character and the hearts of these. And friends, I just want to mention and make a point that we are called into the church not because of our gifts or your talents or your money, but God has called us primarily to follow Him and because we need to be changed. Because we need to be changed. He chose you and I because we are hard to save. Is the church is a place where God transforms our character. Not the home or alone, away somewhere, but in the church. You know why? Because in the church, you deal with people who may not think like you, who may not agree with you, who may like different types of music or different types of worship or different types of food or different types of things. And God is wanting for us to learn in the church to what? Be more loving, be more patient. God has called us in the church to transform us and to change us, not to be conformed. It's easy to be conformed because if I'm not happy in this church and something gets voted that I don't like and, oh, well, you know what? I just go to another church. Maybe I'll be conformed there. But God is wanting to transform us and to learn. John 1, you're, you're there in John. You're there in John. John chapter 1, verse 35. Here, they wanted to follow Jesus. And notice the question that Jesus asked, and it's the same question I, I asked to you this morning. John 1, verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God. This is, this is John the Baptist. Then two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And I'm sure they, ha they have heard about the Messiah was coming and oh great, they were probably thinking about a military deliverer. And so they began to follow Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them follow, said to them, what, what do you seek? What do you seek? Why are you following me? When you joined the church, friends, what were you seeking? When you joined the church, what were you looking for? Now let's be honest. Did you come into the church from a conviction that you needed to be changed?
See, that's why we are here. Because God needs to change every single one of us. Amen. I know it's a hard amen because we don't like change. But God has called us in the church to transform and change our characters to reflect His love, His patience, His service. That is why we are called in the church. You are in this church because God wants you to change. So when someone, when someone transfers their membership to a different church because of a dislike, I understand that people move and move out of the city and they want to continue being active, but when someone moves to a different church because of a dislike that is happening in the church, they are interrupting the, the work that God is trying to do in their heart. Instead of letting God change them, and change their stiff heart that he's trying to mold, they take that stiff heart and just go to another church and plant it there. Amen. Amen. And they hope that by going to another church, the problem is gonna go away because this church doesn't have that problem. They don't realize they are the problem that need the transformation of God's heart, that needs the love of God's heart. God has a deep work to do in us, friends, a very deep work. And let's not think also, you know, that our years in the church gives us wings. It just shows that it takes a long time to change us. Amen. Our presence in the church, our presence in the church should keep us humble and not proud, thankful, not arrogant, subdued, not hard to deal with, submissive, not rebellious, nice, and not a pain. And the only thing that I can compare this change that God is wanting to do in our hearts through the church and the scripture compares it to is marriage. You need change? Get married. <laughs> Amen. You want to change? Get married. A successful marriage requires change. Amen. And so if God is our husband and we are the bride, there needs to be a change in us. A successful marriage requires submission. We have to learn to submit to each other, to our spouses. Because in a marriage, you can't have it your way, at least not all the time. Amen? If you want your, your marriage to succeed, friends, there, you have to change. You have to submit. You have to love like 1 Corinthians 13 says. When you can love that way, you will have changed. In your relationship with God, self has to go. Just like in a marriage, self has to go. And the, the best of the other person is what's most important. In the same way in our Christian walk, self has to go. The only way to be a Christian is, being, is believing that Jesus is better than you, wiser than you, knows more than you, and you stop fighting with him and just submit to him. Amen. Submit to him and let him work in your life. Now the list that we read here of the disciples, of the disciples here, they had serious character flaws how long did they spend with Jesus? How many years did they spend face to face with Jesus? Three and a half years. And after three and a half years of seeing Jesus face to face, hearing Jesus preach, seeing Jesus do miracles, eating breakfast with Jesus and talking with Jesus and Jesus teaching them, at the end, were they changed? 
after three and a half years, they were not even changed. You, when you read Luke 22, at the Last Supper, at the Last Supper before Jesus is going to be crucified, they're fighting. Who's going to be the best? They're arguing. Peter is, is getting his weapon ready just in case he needs it. He doesn't know that he's going to deny Jesus in the future. Judas, his mind, is already thinking of trading the money to betray Jesus. They're not even changed after three and a half years of walking with Jesus. That is how hard we are to save, friends. And this is one of the saddest verses in Scripture, Matthew 26, 56, where it says, And all the disciples forsook him and fled. All of them. Even John, the one who was there with Jesus, all of the disciples forsook him and fled. But friends, I want to share with you some good news. You're there in John. Turn, turn, turn to John chapter 13. You see, Jesus believes more in you than you believe in yourself. In John chapter 13, we have here verse 36. <clears throat> Excuse me. Peter again opening his mouth. Simon Peter in verse 36 of John 13. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him right in front of everybody. Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you that the rooster shall not crow to you have denied me three times. Boom. Ouch, yeah, that's more than an ouch. That's a bomb to what Peter is saying. But you know, the next verse, he's talking to Peter right here. Is that right? Yes. He's telling Peter, you will lay down your life for my sake? Are you sure? Most assuredly I say to you, that's the Peter, to you Peter, but the rooster shall not crow till you, Peter, have denied me three times. Peter must have felt, wanted the earth to swallow him. But what is Jesus' next words? Let not your, who's a your? Peter. Let not, let not your heart, Peter, be troubled. You, Peter, believe in God. You believe in also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, Peter. But I go to prepare a place for you, Peter, that if I go and prepare a place for you, Peter, I will come again and receive you, Peter, to myself, that where I am, there who may be. Peter may also be. Jesus is telling a denier, even before he denies them, I'm still gonna go and prepare a mansion for you. I still have faith that you will do the right thing and follow me. I still believe that if you put your faith in me, although you may deny me, you will continue, you will get back up and walk the Christian walk. Jesus has more faith in us than we do of ourselves. Had Peter been changed by this time? No. But yet Jesus is saying, Peter, He had just dropped the bomb on Peter in front of everybody, in front of his disciples. And I'm sure the other disciples might have thought, that's what you get for opening your mouth. And Peter's heart must have been broken. But here Jesus says, Peter, don't, don't let that get you down. Don't let that get you down. And Jesus is telling us today, don't let your faults and your problems get you down. I am still preparing a mansion for you, Dale. I'm still preparing a mansion for you, Manny. 
I'm still preparing a mansion for you, Junior. For you, Kim. I'm still preparing a mansion for you. Jesus is, tells the denier, even before he did deny them, that he is still has faith and is preparing a place for them and for us in heaven. So because of that, friends, don't stop praying for the backslider. God is still preparing a mansion for them. Don't stop praying for the drunkard or for the smoker or for the porn addict. God is still has faith that they can still turn their life around when they submit to him. And he is still preparing a mansion for them just as he is preparing a mansion for you and for me because God's purpose in calling us to the church is to change us. Is to change us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But what's the condition? You got to be in Christ. You have to follow him. Follow Jesus. When you come to church, we're not here to follow others. If we are, we'll get disappointed and we'll leave. And we've seen that happen. But when we keep our eyes on Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, we will be transformed. All things will become new and old things have passed away. Staying focused on following Jesus because Jesus is the only one who can change us. And those who have been married long enough know that you can't change your spouse. Amen. Amen. And those who are maybe freshly married or considering marriage, you can disabuse your mind that, well, I'll change them. The only one that can change is the Holy Spirit. And so your work is to pray that God changes you and both your spouse. Thinking that the other person needs change but not you is, is dangerous. Both need change. Both need transformation. Both need to be transformed and not conformed. I want to invite you to look at your meditation in the bulletin. There from Testimonies to Ministers, page 18. This was astounding when I first read it on how the angels and even Satan are amazed at God's people that are being changed. There is from Testimonies to Ministers, page 18. The Lord Jesus is making experiments on human hearts through the, what? Exhibition of his mercies and a Abund and, abund and abundant grace. He is effecting transformations so amazing. Okay, he is what? Transforming people, effecting transformations so amazing that Satan, with all his triumphant boasting, with all his confederacy of evil, united against God and the laws of his government, stand viewing them as the fortress impregnable to his sophities and delusions. They are to him, who is a him? Satan, okay, he's amazed on, on seeing the effective transformation that God is doing in people. They are to him an incomprehensible mystery. He can understand how is it that they are being changed transformed and then it continues saying the angels of gods seraphim and cherubim the powers commissioned to cooperate with human agencies look with astonishment even the angels and with joy friend nobody knows that's why we're going to sing the song of moses and have a testimony in heaven 
because nobody, not even the angels know what it's like to live and walk in a fallen world and have victory in Jesus but us. And the angels are astonished with joy that fallen men once, notice that, children of wrath are through the training of Christ developing characters after the divine similitude to be sons and daughters of God. Amen. Does God want to change you, friends? That is why you're here. That is why you are in his church. You don't want to be changed. You want to be left alone. You, like, you want to keep walking in your path toward destruction. Then don't come here because here is where God transforms your character. Here is where God molds you. Where God signs you up with people that you are not compatible with to change you. Where God puts you maybe in a Sabbath school class with somebody that you wish they were in that Sabbath school class or a board member, or a deacon, or a deaconess, or an elder, or fill in the blank. Because God wants to mold you and put his love and his patience and his character in you, in every single one of us, in every single one of us. When Jesus called the 12, he knew them. He knew what he was calling, and praise the Lord that he was not discouraged. He was not discouraged. And I praise the Lord that God overlooked at the Peter in me, at the Matthew in me, the Judas in me, and God said, I still want Harley in my church. And God looks at you with the Judas that's in you, the Peter, or maybe the Matthew in you, or fill in the blank, whatever flaws you have. And he says, I still want you in my church. I'm still calling you to follow me, to follow me. God knew the only way to save me, I'm talking about myself, is to put me in the ministry, friends. Because I am hard to save. You don't believe me? Ask my wife. God knew the only way that I would spend time in scripture, time in prayer, time with loving people and being patient with people was to put me in the ministry. I am not here because I am an eloquent speaker. I am knowledgeable in Greek and Hebrew or charismatic, friends, because God is changing my heart and changing my life. And God knows the work that he needs to do in your life as well. In your life as well. You are either transforming or you are conforming. And it is up to you what you allow. You are either letting God transform your heart or conforming to this world. And God looks over what We aren't and believes what we can be if we allow him to change our lives, friends. We have to allow him to change our lives. Friends, how many here need more change? How many here need need more change? Every hand should be up. Every single hand should be up, friends. I don't see... I can see right through outside and I don't see any fiery chariot for anybody here ready to take up. We all need change. We all need transformation. And so my appeal to you is how many here will follow Jesus? I know we say amen and we say I follow Jesus and I love Jesus but it's so sad and it breaks God's heart and it breaks even church members' heart when other people follow others and they leave because of others. Jesus didn't say the Christian walk would be easy. No. But when we keep our eyes focused on him, disregarding the comments of others, disregarding 
the criticism of others, we will go through, as Sister White saw in that vision, that narrow path where the God's people were marching right to the kingdom of heaven, focusing their eyes, she says, on Jesus. Focusing their eyes on Jesus. So I just appeal to you. Yes, we all have flaws, we all have character problems, but praise the Lord, just how Jesus promised Peter. Jesus may come, Jesus may even tell you, or he may tell me, Harley, next week you're going to do this, but, it's all, but I'm still preparing a place for you. Jesus doesn't just hammer us down and discourage us, but he lifts us up and tells us, I still have faith that if you follow me, you will be with me in the kingdom of heaven. I'm still preparing a place for you. But God has called us to the church because we need to be changed, friends. All of us need to be changed. So how many here will follow Jesus and not follow others? Amen? If that's your desire, I want you to stand. If you want to follow Jesus, And I wasn't planning on this, but I need you to help me. We're gonna just sing one stanza of I have decided to follow Jesus. Okay? I need somebody to give me a, I'm not, I'm deaf to him. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Amen. Friends, though nobody go with you, will you still follow Jesus? It's an easy amen, friends, but I pray to God it, it is. Though know your mother or your father or your spouse, will you still follow Jesus? Father in heaven, Lord, you've called us to your church, to your family, because you love us but because you know that we need to be changed. You've called your disciples with all the character flaws that they had, and yet even after spending time with you, they were not changed until after your resurrection, they began to change. And Peter, okay, we can see his transformation from the Peter that he was before to the Peter that he was afterwards. And just like that, we see also others. John, who was known as a son of thunder, was later called the beloved disciple. So Lord, we just ask that you work, continue to work in our hearts that we may be submissive to you, that you allow us and transform us, that, you, that we allow you to transform us and change our hearts. Lord, if there is something maybe that makes us uncomfortable, Lord, we know you want to get our attention and there is an area that we need to change. So help us to be submissive to you and follow you no matter what. And even if we follow you alone, we continue to follow you. Bless your church here in Cleveland. Bless your church around the world. And continue to work in my heart in my family's heart. 
in my church family's heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.